joining in by the time all the participants are joining in i'll request you to kindly submit your poll questions the poll questions are visible on the screen as you log in a very good afternoon to everyone we welcome you to a live cme on programmatic management of drtb pmdt and tv preventive therapy tpt it gives me immense honor and pleasure to introduce our eminent speakers for today dr lokender dave and dr saril bhargava this session would be moderated by dr manju topo and the vote of thanks would be delivered by dr devender gaur Uh, so by the time the participants who are joining in i'll request you to kindly submit your poll questions we would be beginning in another minute the structure of the cme is once the welcome note is delivered we uh, we would have the first speaker session on existing guidelines for diagnosis and management of drtb and a case based discussion by dr lokender dave our second speaker session is on tb preventive therapy uh, recent advances and future prospects by dr salil bhargava this session would be moderated by dr manju topo post the speaker session we would have a q and a session Uh, i'll request the audience who are joining in to kindly uh, submit your questions kindly uh, type your questions in the q and a box and if you have any comments please type in the chat section the vote of thanks would be delivered by dr devender gaur our first speaker for today is dr lokender dave who is professor and head consultant pulmonologist at department of pulmonary medicine gandhi medical college bhopal Dr. Dave's in areas of special interest includes of TB, asthma, COPD, allergy, and bronchoscopy. His fellowships are of National College of Chest Physicians, Indian College of Allergy and Applied Immunology, Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. Uh, Dr. Dave has over fifty-three publications to his credit, out of which there are seventeen international credit uh, credit journals uh, publications. out of which six are first authors and 11 are co-authors and national 36 publications out of which six are co uh, first authors and 30 are co-authors dr dave has also presented at 14 uh, 14 uh, paper uh, at various conferences like international national state level conferences held in the time to time pulmonary medicine bronchology respiratory critical care medicine sleep medicine asthma and allergy and tuberculosis pulmonary rehabilitation we welcome you sir our next speaker session would be taken up by dr salil bhargava who is professor and head of department of respiratory medicine at mgm medical college indore he uh, dr bhargava is in charge of dedicated covid special uh, covid hospital mrtv at indore member of editorial board lung india co chair of collaboration to eliminate tb amongst india indians working for tb free india he has published articles and chapters in various national and international journals and book we welcome you sir the moderator for this uh, session is dr manju uh, topo who is uh, professor at department of community medicine uh, gmc bhopal and stf cha uh, chairperson ntp mp uh, ma'am has won many awards like who fellowships uh mitten orientation mp state Pre uh, prestigious awards indian association of adolescents health uh, fellowship and iapsm fellowship uh, he has uh, she has many research and training experiences in the area and coordinated more than 15 uh, research project projects and 15 training programs uh, dr topo has also public uh, publications of over 44 in many journals and undertaken many projects in last 5 years we welcome you ma'am <clears throat> the vote of thanks would be delivered by dr devender gaur who is hod and professor department of community medicine at gandhi medical college bhopal also an or chairperson from state of maharashtra he has undertaken many projects in the last 5 years as per uh, dr gaur's training he is a yeah. trainer of i i i it's or chair of mp not maharashtra sorry 
Mm -hmm. uh, OR Chair of Madhya Pradesh for the state of Madhya Pradesh and trainings uh, held in uh, sexually transmitted disease surveillance, specialist aid training courses, MOTC, uh, medical officer tuberculosis control, integrated disease surveillance project, master trainer of malaria control, master trainer of verbal autopsy, state level trainer of ICD trend trainings, master trainer for medical what? certification of cause of death. Uh, Dr. Devender has many publications in peer-reviewed journals. We welcome you, sir. The general instructions for the session are all the participants would be muted during this webinar. If you have any queries, please type in the Q&A section. If you have any comments, please type in chat section. Queries and questions would be addressed at the end of uh, the webinar by the moderator. This session will be recorded and recordings would be shared via the email notifications once the recorder is available. Polls Excuse will be me. At the start. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Can Sorry. you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You're audible. Yes, madam, you're audible. Please tell Hello. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Can Polls you hear me? Polls will be raised at the start as well as at the end of the session for all participants. We request all the participants to kindly provide their feedback by submitting the poll questions. I would like to take a moment to thank Beatrice for supporting us uh, during this event. Uh, Beatrice is committed to meaningfully reducing the burden, burden of both non-communicable and infectious diseases by leveraging our scientific, medical, manufacturing and commercial expertise to develop holistic integrated solutions for diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of these conditions. Uh, they are also a, a global leader in treating infectious diseases like HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, and tuberculosis. They offer an extensive portfolio across these diseases state. From manufacturing a pediatric-friendly enteroviral used to treat HIV-positive infants to providing HIV self-test in low and some middle-income countries, Beatrice is innovating to help patients. With this, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen and hand over the stage to Dr. Manju Topo to kindly open the forum for today's discussion. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shubhi. Thank you for a very nice introduction of all the eminent speakers uh, who are the show of this to our CME. Uh, and to begin uh, this CME, I just would like to thank Dr. Salil for uh, just giving me a call ki, madam can we do a training uh, through this medical learning hub and I can't believe that this uh, today I'm uh, going through that process exercise thank you sir so we begin uh, the CME without any delay you as you all are aware that uh, PM Modi has a very ambitious plan of eliminating TB by 2025 five years ahead of the SDG goals and this uh, this signals his commitment to eliminate TB, which has a very high burden in our country. So as we take this battle of against TB as a, in a mission mode, we need to create awareness about TB amongst the general community. And, and community engagement plays a very, very important role in, in any public health interventions. And today's the both the topics are related somewhat to community especially the topic on TPT because uh, the, the entire infection which is in the household and there the community uh, involvement and the household uh, general population involvement plays a major role. So without any delay, we start the first topic that is uh, existing guidelines for diagnosis and management of DRTB and case-based discussion, which will be taken by uh, Dr. Loke in the way. Uh, you heard about his uh, uh, brief uh, CV. Uh, so over to you uh, uh, for the for taking this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'll request Dr. Lokinder Dave to finally take this stage for a speaker session. So you're not audible. He's just, just trying to share. Yes. Look and please go ahead. The, the screen is visible. 
Can you see the screen now? Yes, sir. The PPT is visible. If you could make it on the slide show mode, sir. Please help him to start with the slide show. Um, sure, sir. Uh, sir, uh, near the home insert. Yes, sir. It is started now. Yes, Very good. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Okay. So, I would like to thank you to the all organizers of this CME, especially Dr. Manu Toko and Dr. Saril Vaga, sir, to give me opportunity to interact with all of you on a very important topic. You know, uh, as Dr. Manju has shared that uh, our Prime Minister has a vision to end tuberculosis by 2025. And most important hurdle is identified in form of drug resistant TB. India is the hub of uh, drug resistant TB, which is identified recently through the surveys also. And we are talking about drug resistant TB now because if we want to end TB, we have to address this issue very meticulously, very efficiently, and we have to uh, reduce the burden of drug resistant TB in future then only we can achieve the target of our NTV 2025 or so. And I have, uh, I will uh, share some uh, thing, what a common doctor, a common, uh, say, postgraduate student or undergraduate student must learn about drug resistance TB, its diagnosis and management, because now the government has introduced this PMDT, programmatic management of drug resistance TB treatment guidelines and it is implementing through the district TB centers also at district level also. So every physician or every common doctor must understand the importance of uh, identifying the drug resistance and how to address this. And I will try to elaborate in the next few minutes about these guidelines. So, The yes, slide has changed. Good. So, uh, the few terms which are commonly used in management of drug resistant TB, and one must understand the meaning of these terms. One is isoniazide resistance, which is kind of mono resistance to, uh, to isoniazide, the commonly used anti TB first line drug. Then, rifampicin resistance means presence of resistance to rifampicin with or without resistance to any other drug is termed as rifampicin resistance. We call multidrug resistance when both INH and rifampicin, the, the mutant is resistant to these two drugs. In addition to any other drug may it be positive or not, we, uh, we won't bother, but multidrug resistance is termed as when the resistance to INH and rifampicin is documented. Then there is pre-XDR, the term used for the extended resistance apart from MDR if the patient shows raised, patient uh, sample shows resistance to any of the fluoroquinolone, that is levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, then it is termed as pre-XDR. And then we term XDR when the most effective drug from the second line, that is group A drug or group B drug, if at least one additional group A drug is shown to be resistant to the particular strain, then we call it as XDR. Now, all the PMDT guidelines, they run around all these terms. So we have to understand all these terminologies first, and then we have to move ahead. Now, why uh, this presentation is being done? It was highlighted in 2016 drug resistance survey that has revealed that almost one third of the strains which have been identified in Pan-India, they are almost having resistance to at least one drug. So this is an alarming situation which has been pointed out by this NDRS 2016. And they have elaborated almost 6% of all TB patients, may it be pulmonary TB or extra pulmonary TB, 6% is huge number. And among the new cases, almost 3%. And among the treated previously treated cases, almost 11 to 12% cases, they have been documented to have MDR-TB. So unless we identify these very effectively through the laboratories, 
we cannot treat them efficiently and the problem with these uh, if you don't uh, treat the patient efficiently it is not the problem of non response of the patient and his chronic morbidity and mortality but we can understand tuberculosis is a is a uh, disease which is spread from person to person and so if mdr is not managed efficiently it is not identified efficiently well in time then it can create a problem for our future generations and the tuberculosis cannot be controlled any time in future also so in clinical setting if you if you uh, identify the causes of drug resistance there are various causes there are genetic causes there are say clinical causes but from program point of view they have identified that mdr or drug resistant tb is a man made phenomena most of the time and this is due to inadequate or poorly administered treatment regimes and poorer tb services throughout the country so if we are not managing the primary tb patient properly then the end result is getting mdr and spread of mdr this has been pointed out very well in literature if you read the public progr health program then this will be highlighted that we have to actually systematize our diagnostic and treatment services for basic tb services and early detection and treatment of dr tb it should be integrated into the existing t existing health services this has been pointed out to the uh, say uh, in last uh, few years this has been highlighted in tb program that we have to train and teach every physician every nurse for uh, the existence of dr uh, dr tb in our community and how to address the patient from their point of view and early detection and treatment is the key for dr tb management at the district level at the existing health system we have to introduce this and we have to achieve our goal now coming to the diagnosis you all are aware in the literature there are various type of test mentioned may be some say microbiological test or say may be some say genetic based diagnosis or culture and everything which is mentioned in say literature we are fortunate that government has introduced all these facilities free of cost within the program as per the need of the patient as per the need of the strain we have to choose some particular test and we have to offer this test to the patient free of cost and then we can make a diagnosis proper microbiological diagnosis now considering the findings of say ndrs 2016 you must have understood that it is very important to document the drug sensitivity and resistance pattern of each and every patient as far as possible so clinical diagnosis radiological diagnosis is secondary when we cannot make sure diagnosis then we can help take help of all those uh, things but as far as possible we should try to document the drug sensitivity pattern and then after getting dst pattern we can treat the patient efficiently now for post graduate student i think this slide is very important slide because this is a flow diagram flow diagram suggesting that how should we address all tb patients now all tb patient in the program we offer the nat nucleic acid amplification test through which we can identify the rifampicin presence of rifampicin resistance or sensitivity uh, status and then uh, we follow with the first line lpa and second line lpa through that we identify that the patient is having additional resistance to isoniazide or not patient is drug resistant in form of mdr or he is having poly resistance or he is having additional resistance in form of pre xdr or xdr what i have discussed in the first slide so this is the algorithm applying various tests of level and we should uh, we, we can classify various types of patient phenotype of patient or let's say uh, mdr patient can be classified in different varieties and according to the presence of resistance pattern and the history of the patient and microbiological diagnosis in hand we can plan our treatment for further management of dr tb and there are various kind of say uh, prescribed regimes are there in the program and then if the patient we cannot formulate the regime properly then there are experts to help in the program who can make the regime for that particular individual patient and tailor the regime according to his need so this slide is very important i think postgraduate must remember this step wise approach for management of 
uh, and diagnosis of DRTB. After say making the diagnosis of particular resistance uh, strain or whatever uh, say sensitivity pattern we get, history of previous treatment has to be noted. Whatever the documents patient have, whatever the history is reported in NICSJ ID, and then we have to formulate our new resumes. Before that, we have to consider if the patient has suffered from some adverse reaction to any drug. And pre-treatment evaluation plan is well mentioned because these second-line drugs, they are very toxic drugs and the patient cannot be put on, say, hazardous path uh, without evaluating that uh, for, uh, say, if we want to reduce the risk of the patient, we have to evaluate in time. So pre-treatment evaluation is at most important. Now, initially, we were admitting the patient. Now it is not compulsory. Depending on the patient's need, patient's clinical condition, access to service and patient preferences, we can start the MDRT, uh, say DRTB treatment within the ward or an outpatient basis, whatever the condition may be. The initial counseling is very important because, say, if you disclose that the patient is having some kind of resistance. There is a panic in the family members and unnecessary stigmatization of patient is uh, maybe there. Then we have to discuss about the lab results, what are the possibilities, what are the drugs available, how we are going to approach for say initiation of treatment, what is the importance of adherence, and then what are the PMDT services options available, what to do next, and infection control measures. These are all the aspects of initial counseling which every TB patient and every DRTB patient has to receive. Then pre-treatment evaluation has got, uh, we, we have recommendations of uh, testing for various functions, including kidney function, liver function, blood counts, serum electrolyte. If we are using few drugs, which are newer drugs, then we have to check for serum electrolyte, ECG, serum protein. Then there are, uh, say, few risks associated with various drugs like linezolate, or cycloserine, so psychiatric assessment and ophthalmologist assessment and ENT assessment if we are planning for injectable drugs, neurological assessment if we are using linezolid and surgical evaluation at proper, appropriate time if the patient can be had helped by uh, say add-on surgical management. So these are all pre-treatment evaluation things. So we have to perform each and everything for each of the patient which is indicated depending on what formulation we are going to advise to the patient. So there are, these are different tests. Most of the tests are being done in various patients initially, and then follow-up guidelines are also there, which test has to be repeated when. So we have to follow strictly to the guidelines so that the patient's safety can be assured. Now, different regimes we know about management of DRTV can be classified very simply. Patch mono and poly regime, six to nine month regime is there. Then shorter oral bidaculin regime, which we are following for say MDR patient, longer oral, oral patient where we cannot use shorter regime or the patient who are PXDR or XDR patient, we use this longer regime for 18 to 20 months, which also contain newer regime uh, based on bidaculin. The shorter injectable regime, which we were using for last five, six years, now we defer to use in selective situations only, we use this shorter injectable regime. And the regimes which are in research and pipeline is BPAL, BPAL-C, BPAL-M regime, six to nine month regime, which contain the newly approved drug, Pretominate from WHO. So the, the regime contains Pretominate, Demisbit, Redagulin, and some quinolone. Uh, like uh, levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, whatever, uh, sorry, moxifloxacin uh, is used in BPAL uh, regime. So these are all regimes. This BPAL regime is not introduced in the program. What we have in the program is H monopoly resistant regime, then MDR regime, short MDR regime, and longer MDR regime. What I have discussed, I will uh, brief you uh, how to formulate regime, and then I will discuss which drug is used for how many days. Now, designing a resume selection of a drug is very important and tricky things, uh, but it is not that complicated. I will try to elaborate very simply how to make a resume for a given patient because it is very important at the stick level also we have formulated ERTV committee and every physician, surgeon and uh, various experts in the field, they contribute in formulating a resume. All the drugs available for category for uh, say second line anti tb uh, uh, treatment they are classified based on their potency efficacy possible resistance in the community availability of the drug feasibility to administer and cost 
Now, cost, of course, doesn't matter when we are providing it free of cost, but for the program, it may cost. So these are all the things which we consider when we apply things, uh, apply any drug for say making, formulating a resin. This is the WHO classification, for classification. It is very standard classification. The postgraduate must remember this classification because through this classification, everything we do in formulating a resin, we have to include all the three medication as far as possible from group A when we are treating the patient because these are most efficacious second line drugs. Then second group is Group B drug, clofazimine and cyclosirin, we can add one or both of the medication in Indian situation where there is rampant, uh, say, spread of uh, drug resistance uh, in the community. So we usually try to add both of these medicines. And if any of these medicine from group A and B cannot be added, then we try to, say, replace the drug in a particular sequence. It should not be hazardous that any of the drug can be used because it, the, there is a system so that we should take proper, uh, say, benefit of a given drug without any side effect. Uh, say, side effect profile should be minimum, the efficacy should be maximum, or it should be comparable to the drug which we are actually omitting from our existing regime. So these are the drugs from group C, and you can see all the drug can be used in the particular sequence in initial six to eight months. That is intensive phase. And then after, say, intensive phase, in continuation phase, only, say, drug, apart from delaminate and amikacin, all the drug can be used in a particular sequence of replacement. So, and the replacement, how we replace, I will explain in detail also. So, whenever we are sitting for making formulation or resume, our resident, they take history, drug history is taken, and we classify the drug according to what are the drugs taken for say more than one month in the past and drug not taken they have to be listed separately then we take the dst report that is drug sensitivity report and which drug are reported to be sensitive and which drug are to be reported to be resistant and there are few drugs which for which we don't know the sensitivity pattern but if they are used or not will take the way will guide us to uh, whether we can use that or not the most important thing is if we are evaluating the dst report it should be from a who accredited lab a standard lab which can give you proper guidance because the tb culture and tb microbiology is a very complex phenomena and a little bit uh, say problem in diagnostic can mislead you and can be hazardous for the patient also. So reliability of DST lab is most important. After assuring reliability, we have to evaluate the DST report. Now, what are the principles? I will just try to make you understand how to formulate a resume. So first, we have to identify which drug the patient has taken and which drug patient has not taken. Then sensitivity, resistance, and DST not available. According to this, the drugs are classified. Now, our first preference would be we have to list like this, drug not used and drug sensitive. Drug not used and drug sensitivity is not available. Drug used but sensitive and drug used but sensitivity is not available. And there is finally two classes, drug not used but DST showing resistance and drug used DST showing resistance. Means resistance if it is documented whether you have used the drug or not used the drug, which it will not be added. So the, the last preference will be drug used and DST not available. So first, second, third, and fourth preference. By this, we will classify and make a list of drugs. So for each patient, we have to formulate a list, drug use, not used, then sensitivity, resistance. And then finally, these four classes should be available with us and first preference, second preference, as far as possible, we have to choose the drug. And now we have to go to the WHO classification, group A, group B, where I have mentioned that we have to try to take all the drug possible from group A and group B. And somehow, if we are not able to pick up the drug from, say, group A and B, then group C is open. So this is how we can formulate a resume scientifically for a given patient. It's very simple. If you understand the thing, then you can perform better. You, if you take proper history, if you look at the document properly, if you say 
drug used means more than one month use of any drug is taken as drug used so drug used is more than one month history history should be very particular i am just giving you one example if the patient has been treated with say hrez so drug taken will be hrez and now you have documented resistance to rifampicin so dst showing drug resistance in rifampicin now drug not taken according to who class abc we will list out in the second column and then drug showing drug sensitivity after say putting the patient sample for first line and second line lpa and few other culture test if we can find out the drug sensitivity pattern then this will be listed like this and then finally we will see that drug which are not used but we don't know the sensitivity pattern now how to classify see first preference will be given to those drugs which are available in the first line then second line so maximum drug in intensive phase we have to use four or five drugs which were not used particularly we defer to use injectables now because injectable regimes is gone because of impracticability and the toxic effect of injections kanamycin capramycin were very toxic so now safer drugs are available so we don't prefer injectables this is gone number 1 now number 2 So whatever left drug, we have to apply the class A, B, C classification, and from class A, whatever is available will be taken. From class B, whatever is available will be taken, and from class C, if we cannot take four or five drug from class A or B, then we will replace in the particular given sequence, and this is how we will form the uh, form the resume. Now, of course, the column which are in red, they are not to be used. so this, this is how we we can choose that which drug we not we should not use at all we can use this drug as an option but not we cannot depend upon z e and h so like that we have to classify our list of drug and then formulate the regimen depending on patient's safety profile now there are guidelines for say INH resistance. This is the first kind of resistance we rampantly see in our patients. In Indian survey, they have found that almost one fourth of the patients' population they are resistant to INH. And if you don't uh, say identify this resistance in time by with uh, applying first line LPA, then we can actually slow down the response to treatment and the patient ultimately develop. Rifampicin resistance in some period and the patient may convert in MDR. So it's a, it's a, the INH resistance is called called to be a driver for the M precipitation of MDR and we have to identify it well in time and offer the replacement of isoniazide with levofloxacin say for six months and there are certain other options also I will discuss. So six to nine month levoflox. Rifampicin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide is given in this drug there uh, in this regime, and there is intensive phase, no continuation phase, a separate uh, to be given. The inclusion is, you know, INH resistance, and then exclusion is, say, if the patient is having extensive disease, if the patient is having uncontrolled comorbidity, extra pulmonary TB, then the length of the treatment has to be extended. So INH resistance. is very simple to treat but the problem is we cannot identify without lab diagnosis so lab diagnosis is must and we have to try we try to say make inh resistance documentation through who accredited lab then only we can treat the patient very efficiently without knowing the resistance pattern if we unnecessarily give streptomycin or levofloxacin which is a common practice in clinicians we will actually lose the drug in some of say few months so uh, without documentation of resistance there should not be any change in the resume this is my key note message now uh, in case of h monopoly there is a prescribed format how to follow how when to do smear say microscopy culture dst it's very uh, say easy if you have a print out of this uh, slide and you are managing a patient of inh resistance anybody can manage and in case of difficulties you can consult with the chest experts and tb experts who are actually having much ex more experience in tuberculosis uh, teaching research and treatment the patient complicated patient at medical college level so otherwise most of the patient can be managed according to this flow 
Now, sequence of replacement, as I told you, if you have additional resistance to levoflox, the moxiflox in high dose can be added. If you have resistance to all quinolone or pyrazinamide, in addition to INH resistance identified, then you can replace it with linozoloid. Now, again, I will request that it should be documented through the laboratory. Otherwise, just playing with the regime can be hazardous and the patient can trouble and the spread of resistance is a threat. We should not contribute in this man-made digester. This we should remember. This is just for example, if you are treating a patient and you have documented that INH is resistant, then simply you will offer the regime of levoflox and REZ for six months. This will be sufficient if the patient has extensive disease like this in X-ray, you can extend it for say three months more and the regime will be given for, the same regime will be given for nine months. And usually the patient responds very well if the patient's treatment is started well in time. So regime is this. Now, if we have documented levofloxacin resistance, it can be replaced with high dose moxifloxacin, double dose moxifloxacin can be offered. And then if you have documented resistance to moxifloxacin also, then the regime would be, the lipinolone will be replaced by linozolate and the regime will be automatically given, this substitute regime will be given for nine months. We have to remember that this, this regime will not be of six months, this will be nine months. So anything if you are adding in form of substitute of quinolone, then the regime would be nine months. After say six months, you can reduce the dose of linozolate or we have to monitor for the side effect of linozolate also. Now, whenever we are adding linozolate for a long time, say six to nine months, if you are giving uh, linozolate or for 18 months, you have planned to give in a longer regime also. So we have to check for bone marrow suppressive side effects of uh, say linozolate and the peripheral neuropathy, which is usually irreversible and optic neuritis, which can give rise to blindness also. So these are the serious adverse effects associated with linozolate and it is not considered to be a very safe drug. We have to monitor, we have to do meticulous pre-treatment evaluation and uh, say uh, very effective monitoring is needed whenever the patient is on the drug. Now, as I gave you some example previously, rifampicin resistant case, now we can identify all those drugs from first and second line in uh, say very top of this slide say kenamycin, capromycin, and everything is written on. Uh, now, we can use all these drugs depending on safety of the patient. Now, previously, the shorter MDR regime were formulated for, say, nine months. We were giving nine to 11 months regime in form of injectable in, uh, say, intensive phase, and then continuation phase we were giving. But now, we have replaced kenamycin with bidacolin and moxifidose with levofloxacin, and we have formulated the shorter oral regime for all MDR patients, we try to fit in this regime. And if there is some contraindication, then we can switch to, say, all oral longer regimes. So injectable regimes are obsolete now, almost obsolete now. In few conditions only, they are indicated. Now we, we just give in those situations where we cannot give oral say, regime due to some contraindication or serious side effects or intolerance of the drug. The, if the patient is, say, pregnant or extrapulmonary disease, uh, apart from, say, lymph node TB, and the patient has disseminated TB also, then also the patient is in need of longer regime and not nine-month regime is not really sufficient for these extrapulmonary cases because the drug penetration is a problem and then, then long treatment is needed for those uh, situations where the drug penetration is a problem. So... And if you have, say, shorter injectable regime and longer injectable regime, one must remember that this is a package formula. If any resistance is documented to any of these drugs, the whole regime is gone. And we have to switch to the all oral longer regime and we have to formulate a new regime. So we must remember that we need not to play with shorter regimes. Shorter regimes are package regimes. Shorter oral regimes. As I told you, the injectables is replaced with pedaculin and if high dose is replaced with pyrofloxx. Usually, we give intensive phase for four months and continuation phase for five months. In intensive phase, high dose INH, ethionamide is given along with pedaculin. Pedaculin we give for six months. Now, in few circumstances, we have to extend this, uh, say, INH, uh, high dose and ethionamide for two more months if the patient is slowly responding and the patient's sputum smear or culture is positive at four months, 
then we have to decide accordingly. Otherwise, four months H H ito, six month bidacolin, and six month rest of the uh, say uh, followed by continuation phase. This is the shorter oral regime. Now, if you have documented any resistance to fluoroquinolone, the situation is pre XDR. So in pre XDR, we have to switch. Otherwise, also if any of the drug found to be resistant, then also we have to switch to the longer regime. Now, whenever we are putting a pediatric patient or any kind of say shorter regime or injectable regime, it should be in consultation with the pediatrician. Most important, say five years and more, the bidaculin is approved to use. So bidaculin we can use for more than five years children and at least 15 kg body weight children, but it should be done in consultation with the pediatrician. This is most important. Exclusion criteria, I have told you, presence of any resistance to any of the drug, particularly INH and fluoroquinolone resistance. Then any of the drug showing side effects, serious side effect, intolerance, extensive TB, or a disseminated TB, and children under 15 years of age, other than lymph node TB, if he has extra pulmonary TB. For pulmonary, you can use shorter regime, but extra pulmonary, usually we prefer to use a shorter regime. Among the pregnant and lactating women also, because of presence of ethionamide, there is a risk. If at all we want to treat them, we have to substitute. I will discuss in say further slides. So pregnancy and lactation is as such is a contraindication for using uh, for starting a drug like ethionamide. We should not avoid to start a shorter regime for pregnant patient, lactating patient. Now, in case of say continuation phase, it is fixed for five months and additional resistance. I have already discussed that we have to switch to the longer regime. Now, here also we have a proper, say, documented plan for monitoring throughout every three months or six months or every month, whatever we have to do is prescribed and we have to follow to see the response, clinical response, microbiological, radiological response and side effect. These are all the things we have to monitor throughout the period. This is normal regime, as I discussed, for shorter regime, for initial phase and continuation phase. We usually give this regime. A point to remember, I have already discussed, so I will not repeat, from start to end of four months and then two months and uh, five months. This is how we have divided the shorter regime. Now coming to all other longer regime, this is also a bidacolin containing 18 to 20 months regime. Previously, we were using all these drugs haphazardously without any scientific rationale. And now we have formulated this very meticulously and this all oral longer regime is available for all complicated cases or pre-XDR cases or PR cases. And then depending on the resistance pattern and the patient has used the drug in more than one month in past. So these two things we must remember whenever we are formulating a regime and then those drugs will, will delete and replacement will be done according to Group A, B, C formula. So whatever I have discussed in last slide is very simple. If you understand, I will try to share all these slides with through the WhatsApp group also, so that this will reach to all the audience if, uh, as far as possible, and they will understand how to. It is not important to treat the patient MDR patient, but we must understand. We must have some say idea how to treat, how to formulate a regime is not, and we can advise our patient at district level and we can treat them very efficiently. So to understand this is very important. Now, in the longer regime, for six to eight months, for beginning six months, bedaculin, levoflox or moxifidose, lenazulate, clofazamine, cyclosyrin, all group A and B drug, they are included. And after six months, we usually delete the rest of the two drugs, that is bedaculin and hydro, this, uh, I'm oh, sorry, uh, this uh, cyclosyrin. So, sorry, sorry. Uh, Linezolate will be uh, reduced to half dose, and then quinolone will be there, and then bidaculin is continued, and this uh, uh, rest of the drug are continued in continuation phase. So, this is six to eight months of, uh, say, intensive phase, followed by 12 months of continuation phase. Usually, we give to the patient. After that, depending on the conditional improvement of the condition improved or not, we have to document and then we can decide whether to increase the dose duration of treatment. Linezolate normally for six to eight months, we give in 600 milligram per day and then we reduce it so that uh, 300 milligram per day is the dose in the continuation phase when we are treating MDR patients. So this is dose reduction. 
now for example as i told you that if the patient has r resistance that is pure mdr but if the patient has meningeal tb so it's a serious form of tb now here we will not prefer shorter regimen we will prefer the longer regimen category 1 failure rifampicin resistance but extra pulmonary tb other than lymph node tb we usually treat with longer regimen now this is a case where we have documented through second line lpa and first line lpa the high resistance to rifampicin inh and second line uh, injectable drugs but we have documented that fluoroquinolone is sensitive now if the fluoroquinolone drug levofloxacin or moxifloxacin has not been used in past for more than one month there is possibility that our regime will work and this patient will be again put on all oral longer regime this is how we again formulate i am just making it revision making a revision that if the patient has not taken any drug and if he only he has got some contact with any tb open tb case then his index case his uh, treatment history is also important for us so we have to remember that also the drug taken here are nil but drug resistance pattern is there in red as a column and then we have identified drug not taken drug sensitive possible sensitive drug and we have divided according to this and whatever group a group b all drug we have to identify and if we are not able to formulate five drug regime for intensive phase and four drug regime for continuation phase then we have to replace one particular drug for two of the replacement drug this is how we formulate the who all oral longer regime one quinolone betaquilin lenalidate clofazimib cyclosporine group a and group b drug 3 and 2 all total five drug are given in the intensive phase and four drug are given in continuation mm. phase so this is how we treat oh, and we have, this is one example of pre xdr case oh, where we have oh, documented oh, resistance oh, to oh, levofloxacin oh. but boxif high dose is sensitive so we can just replace the pre xdr treatment to the all oral longer uh, treatment in place of levofloxacin we can give high dose moxifloxacin say uh, i'll just skip this slide because the same thing will be is being repeated now so sequence of replacement we must remember there is a sequence of replacement if you can use bidaquilin use it in intensive phase if the bidaquilin is not used in intensive phase please omit and forget it continuation phase replacement uh, bidaquilin is not available amikacin is not available in intensive phase if delaminate can be used you use delaminate this is also in your drug approved for children also delaminate if cannot be used then pyrazinamide plus amikacin or pyrazinamide plus ethionamide that is how there is a given proper scientifically evaluated uh, regime uh, formula uh, when to use which drug is clear cut mentioned and we have to use our mind we have to follow the guideline and thus we can formulate regime properly and then if you have problem please consult to the experts if no fluoroquinolone can be used then also delaminate delaminate can be replaced with amikacin ethionamide i already discussed then if you cannot use if if you if you have to stop two or more drug in 6 to 8 months then also there is a replacement formula if you are if you are say omitting quinolones then this is the formula if you are omitting betaquilin then this is the formula so likewise uh, there are replacement formulas given and we have to follow that because not following the guideline can create disaster for not only for patient but also spread of the resistance i have already mentioned now injectable drugs and imipenem silastin etc and this past paraminosalicylic acid they are least preferred drug because of their side effect potential and impracticability for using all these drug for say 9 month but if you don't have any say option available for xdr patient then imipenem silastin or meropenem and amoxiclave that can be used for injectable for 9 months also so these are the drugs which can be used for management of xdr this is one example when you have documented first line second line resistance to fluoroquinolone second line injectable and, and inh and rifampicin and then resistance to various other drugs also this is xdr he is not improved on all kind of treatment offered and we have to select again the same i am repeating this slide because we have to understand the importance of taking history of drug taken not taken dst and resistance pattern 
and then we have to classify according to our preference, first preference, second preference, then class A drug, class B drug, class C drug, and then we have to formulate and we have to plan what will we give in intensive phase and what we will give in say continuation phase. So this is how we formulate the regime for a particular patient. So MDR treatment, DRDB treatment, treatment is a rationalized and tailored kind of thing. We cannot give a 2 plus 2, 4 formula for every patient and blanket regime cannot be offered to all patients. This we must remember. We have to think beyond the guideline also. We have to add some uh, treatment in form of, say, trial also sometimes, but that should be done under the guidance of some expert. This we must remember. Now, point to be noted. This again, I will not uh, repeat because I have already discussed in detail. Now, coming to the Patients of MDR or DRTB who have pregnancy at the time of diagnosis. So it is clear that all these drugs are important. Patients' life is important and trans, say, placental transmission of the infection is also possible. So if the patient has, say, less than 20-week fetus, then we have to advise under guidance of a gynecologist and a team. So we have to advise MTP. If the patient is not willing for MTP, or willing for MTP, that will decide our future course of regime. If the patient is willing for MTP, she is eligible as usual as a usual patient, and we can treat her with a say on uh, all uh, oral shorter regime. And if the patient is willing uh, is not willing for MTP, or she has a fetus more than twenty weeks, then depending on the uh, the duration of gestation, we have to formulate our regime. Ethionamide is a teratogenic drug, it can induce hypothyroidism among the uh, among the fetuses. So we have to avoid ethanamide in those, and we have to replace either ethanamide for some other drug like linozolate, or we can substitute the drug, and uh, we have to offer the all oral longer substitute regime. So these kind of things we must remember for treating pregnant patients. And pregnancy and lactation is an important aspect. So your drug, uh, say, formulation should be done in con close consultation with a gynecologist and pediatrician. This is one example how we can replace in, in beginning two months, linozolate can be given if we are willing to give shorter regime for a pregnant patient. This is not very, uh, say, extensively experienced regime, but there are some experts who recommend this. We can use this, but otherwise, we should treat these patients minus ethionamide because ethionamide is a component of shorter regime and that is a package regime. We cannot substitute anything. But if you want to substitute ethionamide with linozolate, we can try it. Otherwise, all oral longer regime is recommended for pregnant patient and lactating patient. As I told you, these are experimental regimes. Now we have enough ex experience with these also. And the BPAL regime, it, it contains bidacrylene, pretominate, linozolate, and moxifloxacin. WHO has approved the results of these regime for management of DRTB. Yet, NTEP or National TB Elimination Program has not introduced, I, in my knowledge, we are not using anywhere in India. But soon, we can uh, come across a situation where we can use this also. So, we must remember the BPAL regime, BPAL-C regime. Post-graduate, they are usually asked nowadays in the viva examination, BPAL regime, BPAL C, BPAL M regime, and we must have some knowledge about all these regimes because these are in pipelines, and we must know the introductory indications and contraindications of these regimes, which are mentioned in the literature. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I have just briefed what a postgraduate candidate or a graduate candidate must know about MDR-TB diagnosis and management is not a thing to get fear, but a thing to understand. Formulating a regime should be scientifically based and it should not be playing with a drug. It, it, it should be kept in mind that we are not only treating the patient, but we are treating the problem of a country, of a society. So please uh, say, uh, if you are coming across a patient of DRDB, don't get fear of it. Take consultation of appropriate person and treat the patient accordingly. And the most important message, again, I will repeat, try to document the microbiological sensitivity and resistance pattern of each and every patient of TB possible. Because 
you have already seen that almost 6% have MDR and 24, 25 to 28% have some documented resistance to one on another drug as far as DRTB analysis NDRS 2016 survey is concerned. So be cautious, be happy. Thank you very much. Thank you to the organizer who have made me to participate in this event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us towards existing guidelines for diagnosis and management of DRTV and mm -hmm. case-based discussion. I'll request Dr. Saril Bhargava to kindly take the stage towards his... And my presentation report. is over. I can mute. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Uh, towards... Please exit from share screen. You have to stop sharing screen also. Look in. Yes. Look in, please stop sharing screen now. Uh, at, the, at the top, view options are there. You open them. I'll just help, sir. In fact, before uh, we move forward to my presentation, I would congratulate uh, Professor Lokin the way for an excellent presentation. And uh, my simple message from uh, my side is that please be careful while you are using uh, second line drugs. It's a very complicated matter and it should be referred to the experts. Yeah. So can I use start using my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks yeah. so much, sir. Is it there? Yes, sir. The screen is visible, sir, on the Great. slide. Yeah, thank you. So, Professor Lokendra has talked about one of the major things, uh, major problems in TV elimination program. Now we are reaching to the, we are narrowing down the TV program. We are reaching, trying to reach to TV elimination. First, we were trying to control now TV elimination because finally we have to go to the TV and program. So there are two, three major hurdles into this. The drug resistance is one which has been taught or tackled very nicely by Dr. Loke in the way. The second thing, those who understand uh, or who are working in the field of TV or those postgraduates who are listening, must know this, there is one more issue that is latent TB. We all understand what is meaning of latent TB. And uh, I'll quickly brief that also. What happens? Yeah. So the TB program is built on detect, treat, and one of the important arm is prevent, prevent build approach. So prevention of TB disease by treatment of TB infection is very, very critical component of uh, our policy. And uh, the strategy here is rigorous, expensive, and accountable TB contact tracing and investigation. So if you are involved in TB program, or if you uh, want to support the TB program, we have to understand the importance of TB prevention equally now. I remember a few years back, I was in an international conference and they were talking about uh, TB preventive therapy and I was laughing. So at that time, or about five, six years back, we were not using it very frequently. Hardly few patients, hardly few children who were, uh, ch uh, who were ch uh, children of uh, HIV, uh, uh, who were uh, children of TB positive mothers. They were one of the groups or HIV positive patients. These are the two groups where we were treating them. Now we have to go beyond that. And so TB contact tracing and investigation for secondary TB patient detection and treatment coupled with active screening for TB amongst household contacts. TPT is one of the key activities under the prevent component of the uh, uh, strategy. So prevent component, how do we go with this? And accordingly, 95% of the eligible persons should be provided TPT. It is the target. So we all know about the burden. India is the highest estimate burden of TB. And beyond TB patients, we have infected patients also. So the true prevalence of TB infections among population greater than 15 years of age is around 31%. So it's very high numbers. And uh, this has been 
done by this has been found by various studies and it has been seen that please listen and see this slide watch this slide carefully why tb preventive therapy is important this is the crux of everything 75% of the people who develop tb disease after contact with a patient of active tb are estimated to do so within one year of tb diagnosis of the index patient and 97% within two years Molecular fingerprinting studies further confirmed the probabilities of developing disease within one, two, and five years are 45%, 62%, and 83% respectively. Risk of developing TB disease after TB preventive therapy, it decreases by approximately 60%. So if you use TB preventive therapy in such type of patients, the groups which I have enlisted in first two uh, paragraphs just above, and reduction can be up to 90% among people living with HIV. So this is a very big number. Apart from this, epidemiologically, modeling studies, they suggest, show that the effective implementation of TB alone, it can bring down the TB incidence by 8.3%, independent of what we have been doing. So TB preventive therapy is very, very important for all of us. And we should be very careful. And this is the chart you can see. Up, if you do something for risk factors, prevent infection, treat TB, treat TB infection, and if you mix all of them, the incidence goes from the baseline so fast. <coughs> so does it work? Everybody has a question in his mind whether TPT works or not. Yes, it works. Efficacy, current TPT provides risk reduction, as I told you just now, from 60 to 90% between those who get TPT versus those who do not. And surprisingly, the protection lasts between 6 to 19 years with uh, this preventive therapy, infection preventive therapy. The safety. Next question comes is uh, uh, safety. This is another important thing which everybody is asking about. A very small proportion of people on TB preventive therapy they develop serious adverse events, not many. And the most adverse events are self-limiting and reversible. And soon we are going to get shorter rifamycin-based regimes, which have a better safety profile. So don't worry about the adverse event part. And the third and the last, and but the most important part, which chess physicians across the country have been asking, is there any evidence of drug resistance? Because you are treating them and some of them may break into TB also. So is there any possibility of drug resistance? No evidence to date showing increased resistance in the program. So because of TB preventive therapy, there is no evidence yet where there is possibility of drug resistance is there. Protection with TPT lasts for six to nine uh, years. So brief high TB burden countries they have seen that in patient with HIV on ART, 3 HP protection is durable as isoniazid. So it has been found to be very effective. Now, how do we go with this cascade of TB case finding? All this uh, I would like to acknowledge CTD uh, and WHO consultants. We have got slides from them, so I should acknowledge them. And all the matters, whatever I'm going to discuss in all the slides, they have been provided from WHO and Government of India team. So in this cascade, we have to uh, find out active TB patients, preservative TB, TB confirmed, start TB treatment. Active TB ruled out. So if we rule out active TB and there are no signs and symptoms of TB, test for TB infection. And if IGRA and other tests, they are positive, evaluate for TPT and start TB preventive therapy. The most important thing in this cascade is be careful, the patient should not have active TB disease because for active TB disease, the regimes which we are using TPT will be a poor regime and possibility of drug resistance and uh, serious outcomes may be there. So uh, as far as national TPT policy at present, what we have been doing, adults and children, uh, of living with HIV, ERT, greater than 12 months, ruling out active TB. I am again and again repeatedly saying 
wherever we are using TPT, that TB preventive therapy, we should rule out active TB. So what we are, we are doing? We have been using six months daily isoniazid or three months. Uh, three months we have been using HNR. So these are the two regimes. What I will discuss rest of the regimes also. Three months weekly isoniazid and rifapantin. This is another regime. Or there is one more group where uh, MDR TB patients are there. We have been using daily levofloxacin. Or where there is rifampicin susceptibility is there. We have been using four months daily rifampicin. So these are another group of patients where you have been using these three, four types of regimes. Uh, at present, we have H, 6H is available, 3HR is available, and now we may have isoniazid rifapantin. It will be a weekly regime which will be available soon. The process of implementation and procurement, procurement is going on. So these are some of the study, uh, studies which are quoted here. And uh, so completion rate, certainly there may be a problem as we have been looking in the uh, drug resistance or drug sensitive patient. 71% TPT completion rate were there in one of the studies which was done. Uh, as far as efficacy and safety profile of 3HR is there, effectiveness as compared to isoniazid with six or nine months in children identified only RCT and two observational studies. There are lower risk for adverse event and higher adherence rates are there among children given 3HR. So uh, we have to look for other things also, the adverse events as well as uh, the adherence part also. Uh, so TPT, the TB preventive therapy, it reduces mortality dependent of ART in HIV positive patients. So we have to be uh, we have to be alert in those patients where HIV positive patients are in contact with active case uh, uh, of TB. We should start using uh, TPT in those patients. So this has shows this study in Brazil, Africa, and other places have shown if you are using ART alone as compared to ART alone, ART plus TB preventive therapy, the TB risk reduction is quite better and quite nicely visible. So it should be used in patients who are having uh, HIV and who are on ART. TPT is relatively safe. As I told you, we have repeatedly in our minds whether the patients may have some side effects because of that. So there are adverse events are there. Certainly, you cannot say that never it is there. I'll talk about few uh, comorbidities also. Withdrawals are there, flu-like reactions, and hepatotoxicity. Although they are there, but they are of very less percentage. They are not very high, and uh, we can use them comfortably. There is no increase in risk of resistance, as I have informed you in the very beginning with rifamycin-based therapy. It has shown that 1% rifampicin resistance cases among 7415 individuals receiving alternative regimes. So very less patients had... Uh, uh, rifampicin resistance was there. No increase in risk of resistance with intermittent rifamycin. Rifamycin is used once a week. So even with this, there is not much significant increase in the resistance with this. Uh, another question which is very important is, can we use TPT in pregnant women? Pregnancy does not disqualify women living with HIV. TPT can be started either antenatally or postnatal periods with due clinical care. Usually, LFTs are not required, but if you need, we can go with that. So, 4R, that is rifampicin and rifamycin, triple pill combinations may be preferred TPT options. Another important thing is when you are using TPT, vitamin B6 supplementation is an important thing. And so, there is no associated IPT with adverse pregnancy outcomes. It has been found in various systemic reviews, no increase in risk for maternal hepatotoxicity. So it should not be deferred and it should be used with these patients. In fact, a lot of questions have been raised by the treating physicians and the clinicians. Certainly, uh, 
I don't know whether somebody is going to ask, but I should raise myself this question. Persons like us who have been working with TB patients, repeat or restart treatment, those who are continuously working, how frequently should we test it? How frequently it should be restarted? Still, there are some questions which are unanswered. But there is no evidence to date on the utility of repeated course of TPT. At present, we cannot say. As the time passes, we gradually gain experience, then we may be able to answer such type of questions. In high TB transmission setting, it recommends, WHO recommends 36 proxy for lifelong for PLHIV patients. But as I told you, we have yet to wait for some experience, what is happening? PPT after TB treatment, this is another thing. In fact, there is a long list of FAQ, as I told you, on our web, on the website of uh, Government of India, where you can look off, off, after frequently asked questions, resistance, adverse effect, when to be used, when not to be used. I'm trying to catch a few things here. All children living with HIV who have successfully completed treatment for TB disease may receive TB preventive treatment later on also. And uh, then there are new drugs which may also come. They are still in the pipeline and so we are, I'm not going to talk about, but this has been discussed well. Uh, then community screening and TBT to be given. Different countries which are having high uh, TB patient load. Systemic screening for TB disease may be conducted among the general population in areas with an estimated TB prevalence of 0.5 or higher. It depends in which country we are living at present in India. Community screening at present is not being advised. Only active case finding and the vulnerable groups is indicated uh, which should be utilized for this. So clinically, clients which are attending HIV care settings, substance abusing, including smokers, comorbidities like diabetes mellitus, malignancy, patients on dialysis and on long-term immunosuppressive therapies, healthcare workers, this is important group where we are, household and workplace contacts, patient with past history of TB, malnourished, antenatal mothers attending antenatal clinic, and maternal child health clinics. So these are the groups where which are included for TPT in current policy. Uh, in social groups, the prisoners, occupations with risk of developing TB, people in congregated settings, night shelters, immigrants, de-addiction centers, old age homes, urban slums, hard to reach areas, indigenous and tribal populations, geographically challenged areas. So these are the areas where uh, we can plan and the government of India is going to include these patients for TB preventive therapy. So, recommended by CTD to introduce a CYTB skin test and provide 3 HP under program, estimated procurement of uh, TB tests and TPT courses has been done. Uh, the biggest challenge in our uh, country is uh, the, the population. When we plan for anything, it takes one or two years to reach from top to bottom of the country. So it has already been planning. And uh, rationale for TB in drug resistance TB program. I'll talk about this with one more slide. Uh, TPT among contacts exposed to MDR TB with fluoroquinol sensitive TB, we have been using six levofloxacin. It has been used versus uh, levofloxacin has been tried. And apart from this, other drugs are also being tried. But levofloxacin is one of the drugs which is being used in MDR patients. A few more things about uh, uh, TB preventive therapy. We all know the definitions of contact, close contact, household contacts. Close contact is a person who is not in the household but shares an enclosed space like working or in social gathering, workplace, or facility. And the household contact is a person who shares the same enclosed living space. We understand that. So how to identify at-risk population? Uh, not all individuals infected with M tuberculosis develop active TB disease. This has been seen. And so a targeted approach has to be done. So no predictive test to identify individuals who will progress to disease. So this is a difficult question. Who is going to develop active TB disease having infection? So, how to go with this? I've already talked 
people living with HIV, with ART, we have been using six months daily isoniazid. This is already in the practice. The next thing which is being done is isoniazid and rifafentin. And those who are, this is, I'm repeating this slide, six months daily levofloxacin is, is being tried in patients with drug resistance TB. So there are two tests which are at present used in our country, tuberculin skin test and IGRA. The sensitivity of both are high specificity. It is low in BCG vaccinated, high even IGRA is high sensitivity specificity even in BCG vaccinated. Uh, both are easily used, they can be done, but IGRA needs a lab. Cost of test with IGRA is slightly higher as compared to TST. Uh, manufacturing is complex in both the things. Especially we are using TST or the tuberculin skin test in younger age, but it, it can it is being used in almost all age groups and uh, requires information on HIV status affected by HIV and low CD4 count. So algorithm of TB screening, we all know this. Uh, we have to rule out active TB before we go for TB preventive therapy. As far as a few consideration about tuberculin skin test, availability is very important and we have to train the health personnel to do it properly. You need a capacity building and supportive supervision and uh, properly it should be done. Otherwise, the results may be slightly troublesome. As far as IGRA test is concerned, I've used in good number of patients and it is available in MP in almost all district TB centers. The capacity has been enhanced at the laboratories. Um, if it is collected at the periphery, the samples have to be quickly reached to the center. The lab has to be maintained and map out IGRA testing facilities available both in public and private sector. Private sector is also doing, but I have more faith in government system and the laboratories are well maintained and they are doing very well. Contraindications of TPT is uh, naturally one should understand that very well. Absolute contraindication as I've been uh, continuously talking about this active TB disease. If a patient is having active TB disease, we cannot use TB preventive therapy. Although somebody may say it's an absurd thing what you are talking. No, but we should rule out by all means active TB disease. If it's an active TB disease, we have to use the full, full treatment for this. Then if somebody is having acute or chronic hepatitis, we have to be careful and we have to uh, evaluate it. If somebody is using some hepatotoxic medications, one should be again careful. Heavy alcohol consumption because we have been using uh, isoniazid and rifampentin, uh, rifampicin. Both of them are uh, hepatotoxic drugs. And signs and symptoms of peripheral neuropathy like persistent tingling, numbness, burning sensations, they may be there. Sometimes there may be allergy or other side effects because of isoniazid and other drugs. You need to have a good counseling for eligible person. We have to inform about TB infective uh, elimination of infection for this. Why he needs it? What will be the schedule? Whether he should adhere properly and how support he needs? Follow visits to, should be planned for these patients? Benefits from completing the course? What adverse events may be there? And action on development of TB symptoms if it develops sometime. So we should be very careful. TPT is not that simple as it looks to be. We have to plan it. We have to counsel the patients. Pre-TPT assessment should be done, a personal history about uh, his information of the patient, if there are any allergies, HIV status, pregnancy or family planning. If, he, your, if the patient is using uh, oral contraceptives, one should know about it. And if there are any comorbidities, we should know about it. Any uh, history of medication, we should know. And liver functions are, although not mandatory, mandatory if the patient looks well, but a baseline testing may be useful once you start because if it goes above three times of the baseline, then we have to stop it at least at one five times. At three times, we should be careful. The social and financial situation, assessment to overcome the barriers of TPT completion if there are there, if somebody is socially neglected, he is in the prison, and a few more social uh, problems may be there with the patient which may stop him from taking TPT properly. So we should be careful if we wish that it should be successful. And uh, 
these are three uh, regimes which are being used. One is six months isoniazid. Second is isoniazid rifampicin weekly for three months. Isoniazid rifampicin three months daily. Doses here are 180 for six months, 12 doses, 84 uh, doses. Pill burden is certainly less in this one. Pregnant woman, 6H is safe. 3HR is safe. 3HP, rifapantine, we are not sure at present. Although it is not available, we are going, but very soon we are going to get it. And interactions with ART, no restriction. It is contraindicated with few of the medications. One should be careful. And again, it is contraindicated with few medicines. Uh, when we are using these regimes, we should be very careful about the weight part. In fact, now, as I say, every TB uh, providing facility should have a good electronic or digital weighing machine so that we know the weight nicely. If it is, it is around 5 milligrams, uh, if the weight is uh, less, then there are different regimes. If it is more, then the regimes may slightly vary. Otherwise, it may not be that effective. And similarly, if you are using 3HP, again, the weight bands are there. And depending on that, the number of pills, the changes. So you can have that discharge, but the point is that we should weigh all the patients whom either we are treating or who are on whom we are starting TPD. So this is again uh, for these patients, 3RH and uh, the weight bands, the number of pills, they vary. Once you complete the treatment, there are few things which should be followed up with these patients with TB preventive therapy. So all the patients who have completed successfully the treatment should receive a quote of TPT after completing treatment of TB. So this is another information. And uh, five to seven times higher risk of recurrence of TB among PLHIV and nearly 90% of these due to reinfection may be there. Ensure completion of initial course of TB treatment, effective infection control measures and follow-up should be done very well in such type of patients. Pyridoxine has been timely and every time it is being talked about and it should be specifically to be used if you are using isoniazid-based regimes in malnourished patients, chronic alcoholic dependent, HIV infection, renal failure, diabetes, pregnant or breastfeeding patient if it is there, then we should certainly use pyridoxine because peripheral neuropathy, secondary to deficiency of vitamin B6 can be there. And the doses usually are 10 milligrams per day in children and 25 milligrams in adults. TPT should not be withheld if pyridoxine is not available. So although it's available in the market, it's not very costly, but sometimes it may not be available, then be careful, you should not stop it. We all know the possible side effects. I will quickly, we know about isoniazid and rifampicin, but uh, rifamycin have almost similar side effects. In fact, slightly lesser side effects are there because we have been using it uh, in intermittent regime. So, flu-like syndromes may be there. Apart from this, uh, rest of the adverse effects are same. When we talk of TPT, uh, pregnant ladies and other issues come in front of us if the patient is a lady. Pregnancy should not disqualify women living with or without HIV for TPT. They should be thought of once or twice why they cannot be put on a TPT. It can be started during antenatal and postnatal periods taking due care. And isoniazid and rifampicin are considered safe for use in pregnancy. Pyridoxin can be supplemented along with the treatment. We don't have much data about the efficacy and safety of rifampicin in pregnancy. That's why at present it is not advised. So we can withhold it, but isoniazid and rifampicin, if indicated, can be used for TB preventive therapy in such patients. If the lady is on oral contraceptive and we need to use TPT, we should keep in mind rifamycin and rifapantin, they interact with oral and hormonal contraceptives. So using an alternative way, every eight week or higher dose estrogen is concerned in consultation with the clinician or use another form of contraception, which is a barrier type or intrauterine device, it can be advised because uh, it may create problem, failure of oral contraceptive can be there. In women having uh, hormonal contraceptive implants, the interval for replacing the implants may need to be shortened from 12 weeks to 8 weeks. 
again failure can be there then as i have already talked of liver disease uh, isoniazid rifampicin and rifampantin they are associated with liver damage if the baseline liver transaminase values are three times upper normal limit initiation of tpt can be done with caution but if it is an end stage liver disease it is better to not to use tb preventive therapy acute hepatitis we should defer it tpt until acute hepatitis has resolved isoniazid is well tolerated with chronic hepatitis b virus but hepatitis b or c if it is there then we should be uh, using rifamycin or rifapentin little carefully uh, all the drugs they are eliminated by biliary excretion so they can be given in standard doses if the patient is having renal failure as far as tb preventive therapy is considered uh sometimes we come across the situations when there are babies born to mothers with tb disease so if a newborn is not well refer him to a specialized pediatrician if newborn is well tpt may be provided experts in india recommend that the bcg vaccination should not be delayed even if tpt is administered we may use pyridoxine simultaneously so if the mother is taking anti tb drugs continue to breastfeed with appropriate practices like using a mask and cough etiquettes because we at least we know now that the patient is having tb and we want to stop infection reaching from mother to baby this is equally important uh tpt in patients who are using some drugs we should be careful uh there are a lot of interactions where particularly with rifamycin one has to be careful i am not going into detail on this once it is available probably we may be talking about those interaction also uh there may be a group of patients we have talked about uh, patients who are drug sensitive contacts now tpt in patients who are drug resistant tb contacts if fluoroquinol is susceptible then six levofloxacin that is six months of daily levofloxacin should be used in context of drug resistance tb where rifampicin susceptibility is still there we can use four months of daily rifampicin so these are another regimes apart from two or three regimes i have already talked for patients to be treated with tb preventive therapy in patients with drug resistance tb contacts so we have already talked of this and uh, follow up and monitoring is very important individuals on tpt will be monitored by the doctors for clinical and laboratory we cannot leave these patients as such uh, we should screen with four symptoms of fever night sweats and weight loss they should be looked for any side effects was yes one we should careful be careful about what we have talked just now if any of the signs symptoms of tb so if tb disease is emerging the person may be referred to health facility for further evaluation and for active tb a disease and in such case if the patient is subjected to nart or lpa then accordingly the treatment can be planned and he, should, he or she should be switched on to the treatment so the follow up investigation pregnancy test is one there will liver function test i have already talked and we should carefully monitoring break down to active tb or drug resistance tb the outcomes should be followed a person who is initiated on tbt who completes at least 80% of recommended dose or 90% usually 80 to 90% of the patients they are completing their treatment and we and we label them accordingly treatment failed died lost to follow up tbt discontinuation due to toxicity or new in elevated so these were some of the things i stop here i've tried to talk about what is the importance of uh, uh tpt tb preventive therapy if we want to reach to tb elimination we have to check find those patients who are having infection in their body we should identify them well in time because 10% of them are going to break in active tb every year so one should be very careful so if you want to stop the chain if you want to stop want to decrease number of patients we want to bring down the incidence of tb we should identify them well on time and now well planned tb preventive therapy policy is there by the ctd and the government of india we should look at it 
I will be sharing. I can share all these slides with you. They are available on the public domain. A lot of frequently asked questions are there. They have been answered well. Don't worry about development of drug resistance. The patient is not having adverse event. I'm not saying exactly not having, but whatsoever smaller way adverse events are there, they can be handled nicely. So we should also actively participate now in patients who are active contacts of TB, maybe drug sensitive or drug resistance TB with TB preventive therapy. If you really want to see TB elimination in your lifetime, particularly persons like me who are who need to see this type of uh, TB elimination in their lifetime. Look, at, am I right or wrong? So we should go for TB preventive therapy. I stop here. If there are any questions, uh, we can answer uh, those questions. Uh, who is going to answer, Shubhi? You are uh, going to ask questions? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, actually, Dr. Manju was about to ask the question, so I'll request ma'am to kindly take the Q&A. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Dr. Manju, please. Yeah, madam is our moderator. Manju Topo, madam, is the State Task Force Chairman for TB Control Program of uh, Medical Colleges, RNTCP. Dr. Devind Kaur is uh, Chairman of Operational Research uh, Team. He's, he's the Chairman for that. And both uh, these gentlemen and madam, they are working very hard in MP state. And in fact, because of their encouragement only, both of these have encouraged us. We have kept this program for our doctors. And in fact, I found good attendance was there. Over to you, madam. Is, if there are any questions, please ask them. Uh, I can see, sir, uh, uh, there are around five to six questions in the chat box. Can you can you open the chat box, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. yeah Should we? Uh, Ma'am, actually, see. that would be accessed at your end. Uh, I'll request you yeah. to put yeah. on that. Is it visible? Is it visible? No, ma'am, that won't be visible for that. You need to no. take up orally. For that. I can see 10 questions have been answered. Probably Logendra has answered. The last one is open. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sir, it is sir, the first one is open. First one I want to answer. Yeah, please. Yes, go ahead. Logan, please go ahead. The question from Dr. Vankateshwar, sir, is same treatment for both pulmonary and extrapulmonary TB. So, if you are talking about pulmonary and extrapulmonary TB, drug sensitive TB, then the guidelines are same, the same drug we can use. But if you are talking about uh, say drug resistant TB, then usually, apart from, say, pleural effusions and lymph node TB, we usually don't prefer to give shorter regimes for extra pulmonary TB, as I have discussed already. In those patients who are not having life-threatening disease, we use shorter regime. And in those patients who are having life-threatening disease like meningitis or so on, and I have given one example also, for those we use this all over a longer regime. This is one thing. Among the pediatric patient, all pulmonary patient can receive, say, uh, this shorter regime. And in adult patient also, pulmonary patient can get shorter regime. Extra pulmonary, selectively, we have to scrutinize the patient to whom we have to give shorter regime and to whom we have to give longer regime. That's all. Thank you. Yes, uh, look, at there is one more question. If a patient shows clinical symptoms of MTB, the X-ray is normal, sputum is normal, CVNAT is negative, what should we do? Please. This is very tricky to make that. Nice, nice question. Hello. Nice question. Nice question. Yeah. <laughs> this is very tricky. If you are given such situation, then one thing I would like to comment is you have to use clinical, radiological, microbiological, and Montauk's test and blood serology test, etc., etc., everything in the notice. And we have to document the history. What are the symptoms? Constitutional symptoms are there or not? And then we have to think about various other differential diagnoses first. If you have ruled out other things, then you can make a diagnosis of tuberculosis and you can start treatment empirically. But in that situation, you have to closely monitor the patient and you should get response within, say, two, three weeks period. If the patient is not responding to your treatment within, say, two, three weeks period, then please rethink over your diagnosis and then again make your, uh, say, uh, efforts for making the diagnosis properly. If you are not having documentation of, say, radiological disease, even after, say, CT scan also, then also you have to think twice before starting empirical treatment. It can occur. 
you may have a primary disease you can have a extra pulmonary disease where you can have normal ct scan you can have a hidden focus of tuberculosis in some other organs also but in general as a layman as a general doctor it should not be a habit to start it anti tb treatment very uh, at the very beginning without considering any other differential diagnosis as a matter of differential uh, as a matter of say uh, if we want to treat the patient as empirical tuberculosis patient yes look and i would add, add two things here particularly in extra pulmonary tb we come across at least 10 to 15 patients every year of eye ophthalmic tb where they don't have anything to prove that tb is there or not so eptb is one where you have to start uh, excluding by uh, you can say you can put on papers that i have excluded and i have seen other causes of decreased vision and this 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 then you may start anti tb drugs but as far as pulmonary tb is concerned i will say what lokendra said be careful about this because this is era of uh, court everybody can take you to the court if there are no X ray is normal, sputum is normal. So where is TB? Why you are starting me on TB? Even if you do that, suppose if a patient is having persistent fever and one or two things are there, then please discuss with the patients and attendants and tell them that we have not seen anything. But I'm telling you honestly, sometimes you may come across lung cancers or other things which may not be visible initially. So just tell them that if you are really willing. then on consent of both of us then we are starting anti tb drugs but this is a very careful thing any time you can be in the court because of all these things then nothing is there why you started anti tb drugs and then it becomes very difficult for you to answer uh abhishek has another question uh, lokend only mesentric there is one more to... question sir one more question from dr ramesh bhargav yeah. parameter to stop treatment like crr or esr or others as long as you have diagnosed the disease properly you have documented the sensitivity pattern there are fixed regimes and criteria to prolong the regime are also settled means they are mentioned in the guideline when you should increase the duration of treatment there is hardly any say clinical uh, say uh, apart from clinical and microbiological and radiological uh, say parameters there is hardly any blood test which can actually tell you that the tb has been cured there has been a practice of say repeatedly doing montox test and the same serological test and tb from gold to make the diagnosis and again and again the patients are being referred to the tb physicians that they have relapse of disease but this is uh, not the correct uh, say uh, method of diagnosis of tuberculosis relapses we have to make all effort to establish microbiological diagnosis and then we have to disclose the diagnosis of uh, say tuberculosis to the patient otherwise the patient they get panic and they move here and there for making uh, their treatment efforts one question is from abhishek mishra only mesenteric lymphadenopathy loss of appetite weight loss around 8 to 10 kg abhishek i would like to say here there may be uh, the most important reasons are lymphoma so please search lymphadenopathy in the chest at other places in the body rule out lymphoma especially the next thing is sometimes viral infections can also cause lymphadenopathy wait for some time and if they disappear then it's fine but if you want to really start anti tb drugs nowadays in mesenteric lymphadenopathy we are going now with the endoscopies and uh, once you take out a piece of lymph node you prove it that it is tb it is better to stop, start anti tb drugs then and then only now it is the facilities are there the patient has to pay for uh, abdominal uh, laparoscopy laparoscopy has to be done to take out that piece look and you want to add something about that mesenteric lymphadenopathy sir i would just like to comment that what i mentioned that we should try to make all possible effort to make uh, absolutely uh, absolutely uh, yes uh थिंग इज to exclude in for excluding infection tst anigra is to be done for active tb cases uh 
you have to go for sputum examination and net testing. So uh, TST grad, they will tell you infection is there or not. But nowadays, uh, doctors, it is available. Igra is very well available. Just refer to the patient. The patient may have to walk for some uh, kilometers and then they may reach to our centers. And the facility is available, at least in MP, I know. They are available free of cost. And very soon, they are going to be expanded to the rest of the country also. Dr. Krishna Singh is asking if Igra only positive. But AFB, Sibinar, chest x-ray, HRCT, should you start ATT or TPT? Yes. Uh, Igra, right. So if Igra is positive, this is one of the tests by which we identify infection is there. Then what we do, if there is history of contact, it may or may not be there, certainly. So it is a candidate. After evaluation, we may plan for TPT. Uh, the point is, why you got Igra done? So there must be something in your mind. That's why you initiated the uh, cascade of uh, the testing. So if it is there and it is positive, then yes, you can plan depending on your clinical judgment. Krishna Singh, yes. Any more questions, madam, which we have been missing? Uh, Venkateshwar has uh, written that there are ill effects of alcohol and tobacco. Can healthy authority can health, health, health authority Give me any suggestions to government for banning alcohol and tobacco throughout India in the near future. It's a very, <laughs> it's a very. Uh, as far as tobacco and smoking is concerned, government is doing a lot of things. They have got an independent helpline. Uh, you can ca call them and they will suggest you how to quit smoking. I know in Patel Chess Center, it is a national level uh, helpline is going on. You can find out the number on Google. I don't remember the number exactly. But on, uh, on, on telephone line only, if you call them, then they spend 10 to 15 minutes with you. This is one thing. The government is already serious about this. As far as alcohol is concerned, at present, uh, uh, we can help them to quit or stop, not quit exactly, to stop or decrease the consumption of alcohol. Uh, the government is already aware of this and they are taking uh, serious actions on this. The government is planning some programs on this also. There was another question, Dr. Shubhi of Venkatesh. It was very uh, nice question. Can you show that? Sure, ma'am. Um, there was a... Uh, most of the questions uh, were answered by Dr. Lukender, sir. Uh, the type that... Uh, so ma'am, please let me know my question. Dr. Venkatesh, third question. It was nice question. Can researcher will come out uh, that one, ma'am? No, third, third question. Second, how are relapsed patients yes. can be brought under the treatment mm -hmm. and can we plan GPS system to trace or any other method? If you could explain in detail. Sir, your expert opinion. Can I answer, madam? Yes, yes, sir. In the TV program now, we are not only, uh, say, uh, if you are talking about the patients who have been missed out of the program, then the health workers, they go to the patient with all possible efforts and try to make him within the streamline of treatment of tuberculosis as hard as possible. They do all efforts. This is uh, their job now. Uh, the prescribed job is there. And uh, home surveys are also being done. And there is a mixture ID. You must be aware about all uh, uh, about the mixture ID. And if the patient reports to any health authority, and he if he is reported from that health authority, then it automatically picks up ki ye patient, uh, this patient is actually a uh, retreatment patient or a defaulter patient or a say, treatment after uh, re recurrent TB patient or whatever it can be. So based on his ID he can be traced and there is a lot of uh, say research also being uh, done in uh, this field right now these are all the possible uh, say uh, efforts what the program is doing to bring the all the patient in the streamline of as a uh, treatment uh, uh, say pool of the uh, program patients Talash has asked him yes yes sir Sir, there was a question from Dr. Chaila Saad that temporal bone tuberculosis is a concern or your view, please? 
डॉक्टर लोकेंद्र और डॉक्टर सलील सर सर कैन यू रिपीट द क्वेश्चन प्लीज टेम्पोरल बोन ट्यूबरकुलोसिस ए कंसर्न इन क्वेश्चन आंसर सेशन सर टेम्पोरल बोन ट्यूबरकुलोसिस इट्स अ रेयर काइंड ऑफ ए टेम्पोरल बोन ट्यूबरकुलोसिस आई थिंक इट्स अ रेयर काइंड ऑफ ट्यूबरकुलोसिस आई हैव नॉट सीन मेनी पेशेंट्स आई थिंक डॉक्टर तला अहमद मस्त हैव कम अक्रॉस सच पेशेंट डोंट हैव एनी एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ सीइंग टेम्पोरल बोन ट्यूबरकुलोसिस क्वेश्चन एंड देयर वाज वन मोर क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम डॉक्टर कृष्णा सिंह इफ योर फ्लूइड एक्सिक्यूट But ADA less than forty, then can we start ATT? LDH ADA ratio more than twenty. Yeah, again, uh, without documentation of microbiological diagnosis of tuberculosis, it is a tricky one. A test physician or a physician who has experience in treating these patients can make empirical diagnosis based on biochemical uh, reports. but it is not the correct way as far as last 6 uh, 7 years literature i have discussed with you that we are following the microbiological diagnosis first and if after making all efforts to make uh, microbiological diagnosis if we are not able to make correct diagnosis then we have uh, clinical and uh, other methods of diagnosis of pp Dr. Bhargav, can you answer the uh, the Abhishek Mishra's last question? Actually, I think there is a technical glitch. Uh, Dr. Bhargav has dropped off. What is the question? I will try to answer. So the last question, uh, sir. One more question. Please, the last please. one. The TB is the most common in poor patients. Such procedures for diagnosis of MTB, EPTB, etc. So many investigations. People tend to quit. and they continue self treatment and finally result in severe complications in our indian structure can can this treatment strategy be more patient friendly i think this should be the last question to discuss and yes will, yes, uh, yes i am happy to answer this because mm -hmm. we are fortunate whatever we read in the literature all the possible diagnostic tests mm -hmm. now national tb elimination program is providing free of cost to all patients so this is happy moment and happy era for all of us all the post graduate who are being trained in this era they are actually utilizing all the possible efforts uh, all the possible tests which are mentioned in the literature for making correct diagnosis of tb patient so nowadays it is not the problem of fund or money for the patient it is the problem of proper timely referral to the program and is a little bit of uh, available services Uh, which are being uh, made available from government side this is number 1 number 2 i would like to comment to uh, this uh, comment that this is a uh, it is a uh, poor man's disease now in clinical practice for last 20 25 years we have seen a big change now the people are coming from good uh, affluent class the people are coming from higher socio economical class also and maximum extra pulmonary tb patient we are treating from say affordable class also so tuberculosis patients uh, say epidemiology is also changing maybe uh, it is some credit to diagnostic test it may be related to our say uh, health uh, ill habits which we are following dietary habits and exercise and everything which is actually making a impact on say mm -hmm. immunity and then uh, it can be say in a pattern of a changing pattern of the computer band karo changing pattern of say my, this mycobacteria also it could be anything but in clinical practice dr salil vargo sir has more experience than me then uh, i i can tell you in my experience that the scenario is changing rapidly in last 10 20 years yes you are right i agree yes it's uh, any any more questions should be or uh, madam no sir no so this was a last question fine fine so thank you very much from our end over, so over to you dr shubhi yeah i would like to hand over the stage to dr devender gaur to deliver the vote of thanks sir uh, thank you dr shubhi uh, first of all i should congratulate the full team for uh, conducting a nice uh, session for all of us let me congratulate dr first loken dabe for his lecture existing guidelines for diagnosis and management of drtb a case based discussion 
he very well summarize the complicated uh, regime in simple words and with uh, he also the said that the, how the regime designed what are the who guidelines principle of the uh, resistant oversees how it is managed if he very well said that what is the importance of history taking in case of drug resistant tb and how this uh, ians resistance documentation to be done on the basis of lab investigations h monopoly and monopoly drug resistant tb is also told about that how the substitute regime to increase the duration uh, what are the criteria for uh, adding or uh, adding the drug linolenoid in the regime he also said that the uh, injectable should be avoided in the programs how the group a and b drugs are uh, calculated and added in the drug and when we add the group c drugs in various regime he very well narrated the multi drug resistance uh, should not be shorter regime in tuberculosis meningitis means it to in tuberculosis meningitis the longer duration of the regime should be used and the sequence of replacement of drug in longer uh, multi drug resistance regime is he narrated very well and uh, the gist of this the history taking we have to adhere the whatever the guidelines and the regimes we have to follow these guidelines and regime as per the national program guidelines i am also thankful to dr uh, salil bhargav sir he uh, his topic was the tb preventive therapy recent advances and future prospects he narrated very well and he summarized all the details of this to his topic uh, he, he started with the national strategic plan what are the uh, management of uh, our targets 95% should get tpt because if we get the tpt we can reduce the incidence of tuberculosis by 8% in the community if we the tpt should be started in the close contacts the close contact will develop around 75% in the first year of the contact in the 97% of the uh, second year of contacts they will get and if we start the tpt we can reduce by 60% we have to follow the national tpt policies for implementation of tpt he said this tpt should be started in the people living with hiv it reduces the risk of development of tb in these cases the uh, various frequently uh, asked questions we are also available on the website of government of india thanks for this uh, information sir uh, he also said that the efficacy of tpt is very good it is on not it is on based on evidences the who recommended tpt and the definition he narrated that various definition of the close contacts was the close contact uh, indication and content indication of tpt he said before they started tpt we have to exclude the Active TPT, actually the active TV, active TV, active TV is the content indication of starting the TPT. He said the various regimes available to uh, for TPT. He said the TPT is not content indicated in the pregnancy. He is not content indicated in the renal diseases. We have to be uh, use. We can use the this uh, TPT in the liver diseases. he said the bcg should not be delayed in the cases of the uh, mother if the mother is taking the uh, the uh, tpt and these were the main, uh, important my observations and thanks to both of our uh, experts i am 
thankful to Dr. Manju Topo. She is the state, uh, chairman of the state task force, MP. She's very versatile and dynamic. Ready, sir, Dr. Lo, uh, sir, is, sir, telling that I am also thankful to Ms. Dr. Shubhi because she was contact in the contact of all of us. And I am thankful to the medical learning hub who uh, gave us the platform to interact all, all of us. And the very important questions we are discussed by other experts. And in the past, I am thankful to all the participants who actively participated in this uh, academic activity. And they will be provided the e-certificate as, as per their uh, email. There was, please consider last question somebody is telling, sir, in the question answer session. But uh, can we answer, sir, before concluding the Dr. Tala uh, the question we have covered. So what is that question? Kindly share that was a preventive therapy for drug TB exposed patient attender. Yes, sir. So the TB preventive therapy is most of the time for uh, the contact persons for attenders of the patients uh, who are having active TB. So whatever has been discussed, it is meant for those patient, those persons only. So we can use the same regimes, uh, H or HR or HP. So depending on their evaluation, we can use those therapies. Is that right, sir? Then go, sir. No, sir. This was last answer question. Uh, yeah. Thank you, sir, for uh, again all of you and the participant. The average participant were around two hundred uh, during our technical session, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, and we, sir. And we yeah, concluded this in within time limit, sir. Also, thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for being a wonderful audience for this session. Um, I'll also thank Dr. Devendra Gaur for his excellent vote of thanks towards the end of the session. My sincere thanks to Dr. Lokinda Dave and Dr. Salil Bhargava for their speaker session. And thank you, Dr. Manju Ma'am, for your constant coordination throughout this session. Uh, the, I have raised the post poll user feedback, so I'll request the audience to kindly submit your feedbacks. The recording of this session would be available on our platform uh, and you would be sent a recording available email on your registered email address. And the participants would be receiving an e-certificate within seven to 10 working days. Uh, if you have any queries, please write us to at info at the rate medical learning hub .com. For more Thank information, you. you could subscribe to our newsletters and our social media channels. Thank you all for being with us. So we are here for two more minutes so that audience could submit the poll questions uh, and we'll wait for two minutes. Uh, thank you for joining, sir. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Shub. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you for further, further such good associations. Thank you so yes. much, ma'am. We'll, 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 we'll plan. Uh, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. I'll request the audience to kindly submit your poll questions and provide us with your valuable feedback. We are here for another minute, then we would be closing the session. We have many upcoming CMEs towards tuberculosis. For more information, kindly log in to medicallearninghub.com. Can they submit the, their response after the, the session? Uh, sir, uh, most of them have submitted, like we have received 90% uh, uh, responses from the participants. Okay. Just few more to go, and then we'll uh, end it. Uh, we have received many wonderful comments in the chat section. Thank you all for being a patient and uh, a wonderful audience for the CME. Yeah. We have received all the responses. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for your presence. Thank you. Thank you.